Hi everyone. My name is John Woven Smith. I'm the CEO of Genco Shipping and Trading, and with me today is Apostolos Sofolius, our Chief Financial Officer, who will be participating uh, with me at the end for the Q and A. So to begin with the presentation, Genco uh, is the largest based dry bulk ship owner. Um, we are headquartered in New York with global offices in Singapore, where we do uh, we handle a lot of our iron ore and coal shipments, and Copenhagen, which works very closely with the uh, with the New York headquarters on the minor bulk trades, which I will get into uh, in more detail in a few minutes. We are a shipping company that own 40 on a pro forma basis modern high quality dry bulk vessels. We have direct exposure to both the major and minor bulk commodities. And we transport raw materials such as iron ore, grain, bauxite, cement, nickel ore, amongst other uh, commodities as well. And we are traded on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol GNK. So Genco has, a, uh, in our mind, a very differ differentiated approach um, you know, amongst our, uh, our peer group uh, in a variety of, of ways. One, we have a very strong capital structure. We have a cash position of 100, almost $161 million um, as of September 30, 2020. We have a very simplified and flexible debt structure. What I mean by that is all of our, all of our debt is commercial bank debt. So we do not have, uh, we don't have bond debt. We don't have convertible debt. It's all very straightforward amortizing uh, relationship-based banking uh, with, with our commercial banks. We have paid a total of 73 and a half cents per share in dividends over the last five quarters. If you look at what we've done uh, in terms of our commercial platform, we have expanded our, our margins. We now have a three-year track record, which is when we, we began uh, our, our current commercial platform. We have a three-year track record of creating alpha and outperforming the relative indices that, uh, that the shipping industry or the dry bulk industry is, is marked against. We have an active commercial platform. What I mean by that is we are direct with cargo owners. We've done over 400 fixtures in 2020 with, uh, with our fleet. Cost structure, we've spent a lot of time over the past few years working on uh, you know, optimizing our, our operating expenses as well as our G&A. And uh, we, we think we're in a very good position on that now. In terms of um, some other pretty important uh, items when it comes to Genco shipping and trading, um, we have divested uh, our older, less fuel efficient tonnage to lower, uh, to reduce our carbon footprint. And I'll go into a little more detail in a few minutes. Um, and we're purchasing modern uh, fuel efficient vessels. We do have a diverse global team with a very strong culture of safety uh, throughout the company. Um, and probably most importantly in this industry, we, we are a U.S. filer. We are very transparent in terms of the financial information that we put out. Um, we do not have any related party transactions with management or board members or anything along those lines. Everything is contained within Genco as a corporate entity. And then we, uh, we're also top of, the, uh, top of the list when it comes to corporate governance. So moving to slide six, you'll see our, our global footprint, our offices. Um, as I said, we have vessels trading all over the world. So the ability to be real time 24 hours a day with our ships is, is very advantageous for us. Um, we're able to capture market trends as soon as they're happening. Um, Copenhagen and Singapore for that matter, you know, do not need to wait, wait for New York to wake up to make decisions. Um, so, and, and that has allowed us again to expand our margins and, uh, and be direct with, uh, with cargo owners. If you look at the next slide, just to give you a sense of, of what we're shipping, um, we transported over 30 million deadweight ton of dry bulk commodities in 2020. We have a diverse, diversified asset base, so we have our larger Cape size vessels, again focusing on the iron ore and coal trades, but also our medium sized vessels which focus on the minor bulk. So that gives us direct exposure to every dry bulk commodity that is there. And you can, you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, the dry bulk commodities that we've carried. 
and the percentages of what it, what it makes up in terms of revenue stream. So iron ore being the largest at 48%, iron ore is obviously used heavily in, uh, in the steel industry. Grains, 15% used for, for animal feed primarily. Coal, uh, which is used in, the, in power generation as well as coking coal for the steel industry. And then we have, you know, then we get down into some more of the minor bulks such as fertilizers, steel and pig iron, aluminum bauxite, which is used to make stainless steel, limestone, and then, and then several others, miscellaneous cement being probably the, uh, the largest. If you turn to the next slide, um, uh, uh, just a recap on our fleet renewal program. Again, we, we've put the, we put this in place a couple years ago. The, uh, the, the idea is to trade out of our older, less fuel efficient vessels, lower our carbon footprint, and redeploy capital into newer assets. So if you look at the top part of the slide, you will see that we have now completely exited the, the smaller sector, the, the handy size sector. Um, and the, the last transaction we did was we actually took six of our handy size smaller ships and we swapped them dollar for dollar with three newer, more modern Ultramax vessels. Uh, so that was just completed probably a month ago uh, when we announced that. And then our 53,000 deadweight ton supermaxes, of which we had eight, we have sold seven, we are down, down to one. Um, the 53s um, happen to be a less fuel efficient design um, in the supermax sector. And again, we, we had always planned and, and we have now exited um, to lower our carbon footprint um, and again, redeploy capital into more modern, uh, more fuel efficient vessels. Uh, we have expanded in the Ultramax sector in 2020, which as I mentioned with the, with the vessel swap, and we're looking to further expand in, uh, in the Ultramax sector, uh, utilizing proceeds from, from minor bulk sales. On the next slide, a quick look at our capital structure. Um, again, uh, we are fairly lowly leveraged with, with net debt of only $315 million. The balance sheet is very much set up to withstand any downside volatility that, that does come from time to time. But more importantly, it's, it's certainly levered from an operating standpoint to, uh, to the upside, which is where we think things are headed for in 2021 and, and 2022. So if you look at where, how we view uh, catalysts for, for 2021, we believe it's definitely going to be an improved year uh, relative to 2020. We are at a point of a record low new building order book, meaning new vessels that are scheduled to come into service. We are down to 6% of, uh, of the overall existing fleet. Um, and as I said before, that is a record low number. On the back of that, we're seeing not only a recovery coming out of, out of COVID uh, in 2020, but unprecedented levels of global stimulus. IMF predicts GDP is forecast to rise 5% globally in 2021. Um, and this consists of obviously both monetary and fiscal stimulus. So a very interesting situation setting itself up where we believe demand growth will, uh, will outstrip supply in 2021 and 2022 for, for that matter. China's economy continues to lead uh, the, the world out of the, uh, out of the, the recession uh, because of COVID, but we are starting to see the rest of the world uh, uh, recover. We're seeing some green shoots in, in Europe, certainly in India, um, as well as Japan, and, and all three are, are major steel producing regions. We've also seen a recovery and growth of Brazilian iron ore exports. There, there are still, you know, Valley in particular is still suffering from logistical issues uh, due to the dam disaster that occurred in early 2019. Um, but we did see a recovery in iron ore imports in 2020, and we are expecting uh, those logistics to be further worked out in 2021 for increased numbers of Brazilian iron ore. And I'll come back to that in, in a few minutes as to, as to why that is such, uh, such an important factor for dry bulk shipping. In terms of India, we're seeing uh, coal imports um, move up again. We've seen uh, steel production continue to rebound, um, and they're importing both thermal coal as well as coking coal for their steel industry. 
looking at GNK stock performance there there's there's been a lot going on in the uh, at the at the shareholder level uh, over the last month now um, we have seen an exit um, by some of our larger shareholders uh, those uh, large shareholders own 58 percent prior to the sales that began on December 11th we are now down to 33 percent um, which has done a, a, a marvelous job at increasing the liquidity uh, of the stock. Having said that, uh, because of these large stock sales, uh, Genco is, is, is lagging its, its peer group um, and continues to trade at a, at a discount to net asset value. So, you know, we, we, because of those large stock sales, you know, we do believe there is obviously an opportunity um, because of, of the uh, lower trading, which should eventually catch up to, uh, to, to the peer group as the liquidity continues to increase but also based on rising values of dry bulk vessels as, you know, as we see stronger markets for 2021 and, and 2022. So a little bit on the, uh, on the overall industry. Um, you'll see on, uh, on this slide, we've highlighted the, the key trading routes um, for iron or coal grain, as well as the minor bulks. If you look at the bottom of the page and, and you see the red lines going from Brazil into, uh, into China, that is the most levered uh, dry bulk shipping route. It has the greatest ton miles. And as I mentioned before, we are starting to see a, a recovery uh, post 2019's disaster uh, in, in Brazil. Um, and Vale is, uh, continues to increase their, their iron ore imports out of Brazil and going into China. It is, um, that is where ton miles can be created in, in a pretty major way because of the length of time it takes to get a piece of cargo from Brazil to China, and obviously a vessel moves that and, and is out of the market for a longer period of time. Taking a look at... Um, the demand side and, and a little bit going back in history, actually all the way back to, to 1980, um, you, you can see the kegger growth on demand. The, the more important thing on this slide is to recognize that demand shocks tend to be very short-lived uh, in, in dry bulk shipping. And clearly we saw a demand shock uh, starting in the second quarter due to, to, to uh, unfortunate COVID-19. Events. I think the last time you can see something like this is going back to 2008, 2009 with the financial crisis. But what you'll see with both events is that demand uh, started to recover, you know, pretty quickly. Um, and if you you look at since all going all the way back to 1980, there have only been really six times where the dry bulk trade has actually contracted. Um, and four of those, you know, really occurred from 1980 to 1990. So I think the, the more recent history of the financial crisis and COVID-19 gives you a very good sense of how quickly demand does tend to come back um, after shocks to the economic system. Um, coupled with that, um, or I should say differentiated from that, is our supply side shocks. They typically last a lot longer. Um, and you can see on this slide the overbuilding that, that occurred and the supply shock from record new building orders from 2006 to 2010. And then on the lower part of the slide, you can see the you know, very large increase scrapping um, as the market needed to uh, absorb uh, all the additional new tonnage. So you can see that on the lower side. So what we've seen now, uh, and we'll come into some more detail on the next slide, but we're, what we're seeing is that there was a lot of scrapping to right-size the fleet. We've also had demand growth to absorb this fleet. And we are now at a point where we have, again, a record low order book. And uh, we think most of the overbuilding that occurred uh, in the previous decade uh, is now rationalized and, and has been absorbed by demand growth and, again, the scrapping of older ships. So then if you look on sl the next slide here, slide 16, you can see the order book and how it tails off pretty significantly. Um, and we're, we are projecting net fleet growth of somewhere between one and a half to 2% for 2021 versus demand growth of four to 5%. And you can see on the left-hand side of the slide that 
most of the new builds are really coming in the first quarter and then again it, it really drops off quickly and to put this into context you know it, it takes two years to to build a ship so this supply side look is pretty reliable in terms of understanding what the fleet will look like over the next 18 to 24 months. The other interesting thing is there have been some barriers to entry that have finally started to come into play in dry bulk shipping and ordering of ships. We've had a, a real cutback in, in the amount of financing that is available for new builds. Um, but also there is a lot of there are a lot of questions around what the the next uh, fuel uh, will will be used to to power these vessels. There's a lot of talk about ammonia and hydrogen. Uh, there's talk about LNG, but people are very uncertain right now as to what to build um, for the long term. I personally think ammonia and and hydrogen are the fuels for the future um, from a from a green standpoint. Um, but LNG is probably transitional. But I still think uh, people are having a tough time. Um, rationalizing ordering new ships until there's a lot more clarity as to uh, what fuel will be used in in the future which is you know for the time being is is very favorable for the supply picture of dry bulk shipping um, moving to the next slide you can just see where where freight rates have gone they've started off very strong in 2021 um, and I would say it's actually counter seasonal. Usually we see a slowdown starting this time of year uh, due to cold weather in, uh, in China, lack of construction activity from a seasonal standpoint. Brazil does tend to have a rainy season as well this time of year. So that, that again, seasonally, we usually see a slowdown. We have not seen that yet. Um, I do think we'll have a little bit of a downtick as we get into Chinese New Year, but then coming out of Chinese New Year, um, iron ore in particular and coal should should pick back up um, and again we're starting well above where uh, where we did over the last last few years and then on the supermax side again the, the the story is the same different cargoes but we've really seen a very strong US grain trade as well as coal in the uh, in the Pacific in the uh, first part of this year Next slide is on Brazilian iron ore exports. Again, they've they've started recovering since uh, since June. Um, we've seen uh, and and we usually see a stronger second half than than a first half. But but Brazilian iron ore exports they've they've exceeded 30 million tons in six out of the last seven months. Um, again, this is a real ramp up off of the uh, unfortunate dis dam disaster that occurred in 2019 in Brazil. Um, and Valley is forecasting a run weight now of 350 million tons per annum by the end of 2021 and up to 400 by the end of 2022. That, that's off of 2021 guidance of 315 to 335. And again, going back to this trade, this is the long haul trade for dry bulk shipping. This is, this is what really, um, it, when volumes start to flow, uh, can move the market in a, in a pretty major way. Chinese uh, record iron ore imports led by all time high steel input. We've seen iron ore imports up 9% year on year in 2020. And, you know, and against the backdrop of, of COVID-19, that is, that is um, quite impressive, as, as well as Chinese steel output being up 6%. Now, the rest of the world is lagging. Um, steel output you know, contracted 9% year on year. But again, as I mentioned before, we are seeing a recovery in Europe. We're seeing the recovery in India. Uh, as well as Japan on the steel production side. More importantly are probably inventory levels. Um, and what we've seen is Chinese steel inventory um, way down from, from, the, from the height in, in the second quarter and, uh, and actually down to normal levels. Um, there will be a little bit of a restocking that, that occurs in the first part of, of this year. Again, from a seasonal standpoint, as construction activity normally does slow in, in China. And if you look at iron ore port inventories, again, these are, these are well off the highs that, uh, that we saw in 2018. And more importantly, not only are the inventories at relatively low levels, but steel production has continued to grow year after year after year. So the days on hand numbers um, have actually come down even more significantly than, than this graph uh, shows. 
And then in, in India, we've seen uh, coal stockpiles uh, come down off the heights, which is uh, really in the second quarter of, uh, of, of 2020. And we're seeing more and more imports of, uh, of thermal coal and coking coal going into, uh, into India. On the, uh, on the mid-sized ships, very strong grain trade, um, but also an improvement in, in all the minor bulk trades. We've had a, a strong U.S. Gulf season, um, which is really uh, has to do with soybean exports going to, uh, to China. So China, uh, you know, the, the trade war has thawed, so we've seen more and more soybeans go, but also China has now recovered um, from the swine flu outbreak that occurred in 2019. Um, and we saw a very strong Brazilian crop as well or, uh, early in 2020. Um, Brazil, we expect to see another uh, record crop this year. You'll start seeing that being shipped in the second quarter um, into the third quarter as, as a peak season. And I also can't stress enough, we've seen a lot of, of movements of cement um, and a lot of other minor bulks, including coal, um, that, have, that have helped push up the, uh, the Ultramax mid-size vessel rates. So again, just going back to what I talked about earlier um, in terms of catalysts for 2021, record low order book, a lot, uh, lot of visibility on that order book for the next two years, um, unprecedented levels of global stimulus. We've got the recovery coming out of, uh, of COVID-19, but also a massive amount of monetary and fiscal stimulus globally. Um, and IMF is predicting GDP to, to rise by 5% in 2021. China's economy, we, we expect that to continue uh, on the recovery side, but we also expect to see Europe, India, and Japan um, enter that economic uh, improvement zone, if you will. Iron ore imports out of Brazil should continue to, uh, to move up in 2021. Again, that's the long haul dry bulk trade. And then India's coal imports and steel production will, will continue to, to rebound. So just finishing up on Genco as a, as a company, I mean, we, we're very well positioned uh, going forward for this market. We have a very experienced US-based management team. As I mentioned before, we are a US filer very high governance standards, high transparency on the financial side. The dry bulk market in general, we expect demand to grow between four and 5% against a backdrop of, a, of net fleet growth of somewhere between one and a half to 2% 2 for 2021. Very strong balance sheet. Again, you know, allows us to, uh, to withstand any market volatility on the downside, but as I said, more importantly, very much levered to, uh, to an improving dry bulk market with our large ships in the Cape size sector, and then our mid-sized ships in the, uh, in the minor bulk sector. We've been modernizing our fleet, lowering our carbon footprint. We've completely exited the, uh, the small vessel sector, the handy size, and we're concentrating on the Capes, uh, the Cape size sector and the iron on coal trades, and then the Ultramaxes in the, in the minor bulk trades. Commercial platform, again, three-year track, track record of creating alpha, full service logistics solution for our customers who we are, who are, we are direct with. And then the fleet itself, um, you know, we, we take what we call a barbell approach to the fleet composition between the Cape size that are handling the iron ore and coal trades, which, which provide a lot of upward uh, potential. And then the Ultramax, which is more focused on the minor bulks, which is a little more slow and steady um, and, and predict, um, you know, predictable and, and strong cash flows. So with that, Paul, thank you very much for, for the opportunity. Uh, and and Apostolos and I are, are happy to take any questions. Great, John, thank you. Thank you for a great presentation. Also welcome to Apostolos. Um, I, my name is Poe Fratt and I cover Genco shipping for Noble Capital Markets. I have close to 30 years of research experience, both in the buy side and the sell side. And John, I, I, your enthusiasm for the market just jumps out, you know, at me. It's, um, I think we are hopefully at the, the point where supply and demand, you know, fundamentals, which have looked good for Frank the last two years, you know, will finally take hold, you know, and have a durable recovery. Um, you walked, you did a great job on the demand side of the equation. 
And it seems like most of the, you know, commodities and materials that you move around the world are in a secular, you know, positive secular trends. Can you just address the, you know, in light of, you know, what's potentially going to happen on carbon emission regulation, how does coal fit into your, you know, your thesis? It would seem like the one where there might be a little bit of a headwind from a secular trend. So um, on the coal side, you know, I, I still think coal is going to be, at least for the next 10 years, a very important dry bulk commodity. There is no doubt that we have seen uh, the European market cut back pretty significantly on the coal side. Um, and, uh, and so the, it, I would actually say they've retracted uh, quite a bit from the market. Having said that, we, uh, we continue to see growth in India. We continue to see growth in Vietnam, Turkey, Pakistan, um, the Philippines, and I, I believe we could see growth this year uh, in China as well. Um, the, the reality is there, uh, there are still coal-fired power plants being built today. They are they are they are clean coal fire plants just to, to be very clear um i mean it, it's uh it's it's night and day from from what we saw even 10 years ago being built um but they are still being built the uh i would say the trade has shifted quite a bit um it shrank in the in the atlantic basin and in europe but we've seen increases in in asia great and i, I should have you know um highlighted that, you know, more addressing the secular trends against thermal coal, coal as opposed to medical. Sure. Yep. Well, um, fair enough. Um, and then you talked about the U.S. trade war and, you know, potentially with the change of administration. Do you think that accounts for a lot of the pickup in soybean, you know, exports out of the U.S.? I think, there are two, I, think, I think, yeah, I think there are two things. Um, I, I do think relations, um, started to to thaw maybe over the last six to eight months um but i think it's probably also very important that the swine flu epidemic came to an end uh or at least has been reduced pretty significantly from the height in 2019 and so you're really starting to see the the hog populations in china recover um and you know most of this is used for animal feed and um so I, I, I think that has a has a pretty major factor uh, embedded as well. Okay, and then you know you you talked about the low order book and just how we, you know that that for lack of a better word that pig or that snake or that um, animal finally got through the python's you know stomach if you will and we're finally at the point where the order book has been fully absorbed in the new builds that you know, were, were delivered earlier this decade have been fully absorbed. Do you see a, a, a major catalyst out there for new orders? I, to, you know, with any industry that's capital intensive, you do worry that higher rates will incentivize companies to order new yeah. bills. And, you know, what do you think that's a potential catalyst there or are there other factors that will limit orders? Uh, look, I would, I obviously, I would hope not, and I would, you know, implore all of my peers not to uh, to go <laughs> and order ships. Um, again, I do think there are some bar barriers to entry now, particularly because of the financing that has been cut back pretty significantly for uh, for shipping in general. Um, I do think, again, there's a real question as to what will be powering these ships uh, going forward. And when you're when you're looking at assets that have a 20 to 25 year life. It's hard to get your head around ordering something where, you know, you could be halfway through the useful life of that ship and it could be obsolete because of regulations on the environmental side, um, which, by the way, we view as, as very positive. Um, but as, as new fuels, uh, more green fuels, less carbon intensive uh, start to power these ships, you know, over the next couple decades, I, I think there's a real question as to whether you order. And I think that's been very helpful as well. Um, so, yeah. I have a couple more questions, but in the meantime, let me just highlight if you're watching, uh, in the lower right-hand corner, you can um, click on the bubble and submit a question, and I'll try to incorporate into the, the present or the Q&A. 
But in the meantime, John, you know, taking a step further on the, the fuel transition that you potentially are looking at, will you have to order new um, ships or can you modify your existing ship, at, you know, your existing fleet at a reasonable cost? I, I think it remains to be seen. We, we're actually spending quite a bit of time on, on the ammonia, ammonia side um, and understanding what can be done there. Um, I don't think you're going to see an, an engine or a retrofit for that matter available probably until 2024 um, at the earliest. Uh, but I think it's, it's a little too early to tell whether it's cost effective to, um, to retrofit your engine versus actually planning for the longer term future and, and, and ordering, um, you know, ammonia or hydrogen fueled, uh, ships. There's still, uh, Still a lot of water to go uh, under the bridge on this, um, but we're, like I said, th th this is becoming a major focus for us, um, and we're spending a lot of time on it. Any idea whether those new fuel or pr uh, propulsion technologies will be more expensive um, than the existing, or sort of what potential, you know, steel costs are up, so new build costs might be going up too. It, could they potentially impact the, the cost of building a new vessel? So the answer is yes. And I, and I want to, you're, you're, you're sort of bringing up an interesting point also that, that I want to make sure I mention going back to your previous question on, on supply. What, what's also happened here, which, um, you know, what I would say disincentivizes people for the time being on building uh, new ships is that secondhand prices are actually less than, than new building prices. Um, so th there isn't really a financial incentive even to to go out and, and order ships at this point. Um, but going to your question overall, yes, I, I think I think um, I, I think new builds will go up, um, particularly as we get into uh, newer engine types that are that are burning. Uh, again, they're really not burning fossil fuels. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I think the, the cost of ships will go up, which obviously means the, the cost of shipping ultimately will, uh, will, will move. Um, again, I look at this as a good trend, both because of the reducing of, of greenhouse gas emissions, but also companies like Genco are very well set up to navigate new regulations and, um, and, and we obviously take the environmental um, issues very seriously. I think a lot of the smaller companies are, are not that well set up. So we actually could see some consolidation um, and, uh, and hopefully higher returns on capital as more and more environmental regulations uh, come into play. Great. Can you just in, uh, discuss, you know, how you responded to IMO 2020 and then maybe potential, you know, potentially add in, you know, out, fuel spreads were a little bit lower than people, you know, thought post IMO 2020, but you still, can you highlight how much of that initial investment you've recovered just over the first year? Yeah, so we, we installed uh, gas scrubber systems on, uh, on our large ships, our Cape size vessels, our 17 Capes. Um, we elected not to do it on on any of our any of our mid to, to smaller size vessels. We we could not get our heads around um, return on capital numbers for for a variety of reasons on the mid size ships. Um, we we did have our scrubbers installed, uh, you know, really by November of 2019. So we were able to capture some pretty high spreads at that time. Um, the spread dropped down to probably sixty dollars, and now we're close back up to probably a little over a hundred. So we have recovered, I would say, maybe forty-five to forty-seven percent of our of our investment. And I I, I got to tell you, it's a little sometimes a little difficult to compare that number to our peers because what we put in that number is everything, meaning not just the cost of the scrubber systems but also the opportunity costs that, uh, that we had as those ships were, were out of service. So we use, a, a, I would say, a more robust number than, than some of the other data that, that I've seen out there. And yet we're still, like I said, we've paid, yeah, it's probably about 45 to 47%. And return on capital at, you know, at $100 is, uh, is close to 30%. Um, so it, it's, uh, 
from a financial standpoint, it's turned out to be uh, the, the right move for us. Great. And, um, you know, I think you highlighted that, you know, going into the year, we're a little bit ahead of expectations relative to what's a typical year. You know, if you look at the last two years, just looking at CAPE rates, they're about 10,000 higher. You know, yeah. gives you a little bit of, you know, cushion for the, you know, rest of the year, hopefully, and absorbing the seasonality. But do you, can you just highlight, you know, some of the things that are causing them and just reiterate those and just sort of how long potentially we might see them last? I mean, with the stimulus coming out of China and China leading, could we see a much more muted Chinese New Year impact this year? Um, hard to tell. Um, I, I do think, again, I do think as you get into the second part of February, we could see a little bit of a slowdown on the rate side. And, and again, it's purely seasonal and, and purely centered around Chinese New Year um, and then just the seasonal slowdown in construction activity. What's driving things right now is I think you have a situation where you have a much more balanced fleet in terms of supply and demand. And what I mean by that is the when 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 you have some congestion or demand growth, particularly the Cape Side fleet reacts very quickly uh, to that, which is why I think we've seen numbers move up. And and I what I take away from it more so than the than the actual numbers is that again we're we're coming into a much better balanced uh, supply and demand equation than than we've seen over the last you know five to seven years. And then when you look at um you know, the, the asset sale or the asset swap you did, it's fairly unique. And can you just talk about sort of how that, how that happened and just sort of what you, sort of how you did the relative valuation of, you know, swapping out the handies and, you know, acquiring the, the ultras? Yeah, so the valuation was, um, was actually quite straightforward because just as we normally do, we used, we used uh, two sets of broker valuations and, uh, and, and agreed on terms. Um, but you're right. It was very unique. Uh, it took a lot of um, a lot of patience and a lot of time to put this transaction together. But the end result was um, a, what I believe is a very elegant way for us to exit six handy sized vessels without having to sell it all in one fell swoop and take a discount and trade into vessels that, in our mind, are are better suited for our fleet. Um, the uh, the 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 counterparty and the other end, I, I um, you know, I, are just a very professional organization and, you know, couple that with Genco, that's why we're able to, to get this done. It takes a lot of trust between two companies to, to get something like this executed. And uh, again, a lot of work uh, from both sides and uh, it, it goes to show you what two professional organizations can do. And then, you know, one thing that came up recently or at least yesterday, was that customer, you know, tell me what customers are, are you know, how customer discussions are, are you know, developing. Um, you know, one thing it seems like is that we've switching from a just-in-time to a just-in-case time frame, and people are planning a little bit further in advance and, and potentially on the verge of making longer-term commitments. Is that what you're seeing from your customer base and then on the cargo side? you know, the sort of a comment on cargo demand? Look, we've seen, we've certainly seen it on the minor bulk side. Um, we're seeing it more and more. Um, we, we're able to book forward cargoes uh, farther in advance than, than we have in, in previous years. I think the, um, clearly the, where, because of the price of where commodities have gone, I think that's the big incentive as to, as to why people are trying to plan further and further down the road. Um, and we've obviously seen, seen very strong commodity prices, particularly in the iron ore front. Coal prices have, have started, you know, have moved up and, and the price of soybeans as well. So three major dry bulk commodities have seen strong price moves to the upside. And thanks for highlighting the, you know, the exit of um, some of the major shareholders out there and just the potential overhang that might have created and I know it's, you know, beyond your control and, you know, you probably aren't involved in the discussions, but uh, any, any indication of why they're selling, John, and why they chose to exit on, you know, what, on the verge of what appears to be the, you know, a really positive supply-demand equation for the dry bulk market? 
Look, you know, the, the one thing I'll say is, um, you know, I, I believe there, 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 there was overhang. I, I focus less on the overhang and more on looking forward and the liquidity that's, that's being created in the stock. Um, and I think that is really the, the positive attribute of this. Um, look, I, it's hard for me to, I mean, I, I think everybody is, is different in terms of why they may or may not want to, uh, to exit at, at a certain time. There, you know, there are time frames to these funds. But, you know, Poe, honestly, as you said, I, I, I'm not involved in, in these conversations. Um, and my guess is each fund has a, has a different view and, you know, internal views as well that, that they have to deal with. Sounds great, John. Um, thank you for a really comprehensive, not only presentation, but answer session. And uh, thank you, Apostolos, for standing by. We really appreciate your participation in NobleCon 17. And we look forward to a, a pretty interesting 2021. Great. Thanks again, Poe. Great to see you.